Amen. Uh, this morning we will be in Colossians chapter 3, if you want to turn a Bible there now before we read it. Uh, I want to mention a couple of quick things first, though. Uh, one is, for those of you guys watching online and joining us online, um, if there's, a, is just thought of this, if there's ever a reason you can't be here but you would like to be, let us know if it's a ride, if it's something else. We would love to help you be here if you want to be. Uh, before we get to our sermon today, though, I also wanted to mention a couple of weeks ago, we had our first night what we call Engaging Conversations, where we talked about defining the terms and helping us work through some of the conflict and issues in our society that exist today. Uh, and it was really well received. I really appreciate it. It was on a Wednesday night, but going forward through Lent, we have so many things happening in the church that um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday nights are all so busy. So we decided, well, we, I decided, kind of unilaterally, actually, because there's just so many things going on, and that's why I didn't make it in the bulletin. Uh, I finalized it this week. Uh, we're going to have um, future engaging conversation nights on Monday nights, and we're going to start a week from tomorrow, February 12th. So if you're able to come, uh, we would love to have you. They'll be at 6.30. February 12th will be our first one, and we're going to start with defining the term, what is Christian nationalism? And uh, the reason we do these things, we're going to talk about some divisive issues in our world today during the week because I don't think it's necessarily appropriate for worship, but we also want to have a conversation engaging with one another as the body of believers, because it is important to engage with one another so that we can engage with our community. And so we'll be doing those uh, every other week, basically, for the foreseeable future. Um, and the first one will be February 12th, and we'll send out an email this week with the calendar and all the things. So that'll be a week from tomorrow. The other thing I wanted to mention, I forgot to mention it in the first service, is that our worship director, Jeanette, is now officially, as of February 1st, full-time with us in a full-time role. And so if you don't like what I have to say during the engaging conversations, discussions, please email her at Jeanette at GraceTucson.org. Jokes. All right. Uh, continuing our series, we are in a life of grace. And this is our relational covenant, gratitude with humility, relationships that are God-honoring, always gentle, loving, and open communication. And then this morning, we are in the fourth of five, consideration and respect, that we seek to extend grace and forgiveness in relationships to one another. Last week, we talked about how we can kind of get to conflict and, and, and get to the root of some conflict, go directly to the person, ask them questions, listen, share our heart and feelings. But then we're forced to the decision after that, if we get in conflict with someone, to forgive. How do we find the grace to forgive one another? How do we let things go? You know, next week we're going to move on to empathy-driven unity, which hopefully if we're living empathetic lives towards one another, it really helps us avoid conflict. But, but today we need to talk about forgiving one another. And so we're going to read... Colossians chapter 3, and hopefully learn some principles on how we can live this life of forgiveness that Christ calls us to. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. Uh, please follow along on the screen or in your Bible. Since then, brothers and sisters in Christ, this is to the church, as all these letters are. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge of, in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian or Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If anyone you view has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. 
Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. All right. So uh, we saw some things there about forgiveness, about peace, about all these other things. But one of the things I really want to point out is we saw it last week, too, talking about peace, that if the Apostle Paul had a thesis outside of the most important thing is Jesus' death and resurrection, it was unity in the church, right? Paul wanted the church to be unified. And so he says in verse 1, you have been raised with Christ. If you are a Christian, now, some of you in a room this size and people worshiping with us might not all identify as Christians. That's okay. But if you are a Christian, and this is something you have said, you've been baptized, you've, you've made a profession of faith, you decided to follow Jesus, this is the underpinning thing of unity, that we have been raised with Christ and we are to set our hearts and our minds on God. Verse 3, for we have died. This is why we call it being born again, right? We have died to our old self, and we've been raised with Christ. If you are a disciple or a follower of Jesus, this is the foundation. It's not just something we're trying out for a season, but it is our new identity. So then, if that's true, verse 5, Paul says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your old earthly nature. You are not of this world. We talked about this last year. You are a peace ambassador. You are of another world. You are of the kingdom of God. You are here to bring peace as an ambassador living in another land. Therefore, put to death those things of your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. See, the Apostle Paul has a number of times in the, in, in the New Testament where he lists sins and different things, but, but, but what he's saying here is this, is those things should no longer be the things that come from your life. In your relationship with God, the first thing is our personal relationship. That's what we talk about all the time. It's our personal relationship with Jesus, and God reveals to us the things that we ought to change. We know this. We know this. We, 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 we do something. We, we, we feel remorse. We feel guilt. We change. We realize these things are not beneficial. You know, all of these things. And you extend it to the list in verse 8 too. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language. All of these things do not bring Christ to the world. And instead, they're selfish. That's the heart of these things. That's the heart of sin is that we have decided to live for ourselves rather than for our neighbor. God has called us to love God and love people, and yet we, when we sin, we are living for ourselves. So whether it's lust, evil desires, greed, anger, rage, malice, slander, it's all selfishness. And what God is saying is put to death the desires to live only for yourself and live for Christ. So yes, we need to get rid of the sin in our lives. Yes, we need to be aware of these things. Yes, we need to be convicted of the sin in our lives that keeps us from being peacemakers. But I want to point something out here. We should be convicted, but we should not be destroyed by this. Because the Apostle Paul goes into something really important here. Many times in church, we read these lists or we see these things, and immediately we're overcome with guilt, sometimes even shame. To, oh, gosh, you're right, Sam. I can't do it. Here I am again in church, I'm reminded of things that are not of God, that I get so angry, or this, or that, or the other, and it's, I'm a bad Christian. How many times have we been in church, you don't need to raise your hand, I'll raise it for all of us, where we've been in church, and we hear something like this, and immediately, we think we're not worthy, that we don't measure up, that we still struggle, and we think no one else in this room is struggling, and we feel about this big. That's not the point of this text. We should be convicted, but we're not destroyed. Because one of the things Paul says next that's very important is that none of us are better than the others. And in fact, this salvation, this sanctification, this becoming more like Jesus is a process. It says, do not lie to each other. And remember, verse 10, that's being renewed. You have put on the new self. This is language of like clothing, right? We put off, like think of it as a jacket. We put off the old self. We put on the new self, but that we are being renewed day in and day out. We should feel convicted, but not beaten up that we're not any better or worse than anyone else in the room because it's not about comparing ourselves to other people in the room. It's about our relationship with God and what God is doing in our hearts. Because, and then he goes into verse 11, there is 
No divisions. There is none greater. There is none worse. We're all on this journey of sanctification together. How much, how great would it be? How much would I love it if when we became a Christian, all the earthly stuff died? (laughs) All your pride just gone. Wouldn't that be great? All your selfishness just gone. But that's not our experience. It's just not. And we need to realize, verse 10, that these things are being renewed daily, that these things are being grown in us all the time. And this is a practice we have to practice all the time. And it's not just for us and for our relationship with God, but it's also for our community. And that's why Paul then shifts in verse 9 and following to community life together. Don't lie to each other. Don't, Don't practice old earthly things with one another But instead, realize you're all the same, verse 11. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with all the good things. Do all the fruit of this. Live your life with the fruit of the Spirit. We should be convicted, but not destroyed. Our conviction should lead us to holiness and sanctification. Our conviction should lead us to want more of these things together in community. Because just so you know, you cannot overcome those earthly things by yourself. I just want to point that out. If any one of us holds these things in and hides and pretends we we can overcome those struggles by ourselves, how's that working out? And so Paul then says, listen, there's the old self, there's the new self, and the way we do it is by doing it together, putting on these things together. And verse 13, then what does that look like? We bear with each other and forgive one another. If anyone has a grievance against someone, forgive them as the Lord forgave you. And again, this is the same in Ephesians chapter 4 where the apostle says to the church, bear with one another. It's not going to be perfect. There is no perfect community. But you need to bear with one another and forgive one another. And oh, by the way, whatever you do, verse 14, you better make sure your motivation is love and unity. That's the goal, love and unity together. So much of our lives revolve around this old self that we are supposed to have, supposed to have taken off that is selfish, that we want to feel all of these things about how, what we want. But what Paul says to the church in the first century, 20, 30, 40 years after Jesus, that was already dividing was that you have to get rid of those selfish desires and forgive one another and do it in love and peace, verse 14 and 15. And that's the second thing I want to share is we need to, first thing is we need to be convicted. We're not beaten up about it, but we're convicted about it. And then the second thing is, in the church, the rule is we forgive. In the church, with brothers and sisters in Christ, we are called to forgive one another. If we are his disciples, we forgive one another, we don't hold grudges. Because Jesus forgave you all your stuff, you are called to do the same for others. Verse 15, 16, and 17 says as much. That Christ did this for all, and so too should we. We are called to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts and be thankful for one another and build each other up in worship and in thanksgiving and all the stuff we do together. Because why? You were dead and now you're alive. How many of you, when you were at your worst, maybe you're at your worst now, I don't know, could save yourself? How many of us, when we were at our most broken point, could lift ourselves up and make it all better ourselves? None of us. We all relied on the grace of God and the love of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so, because of that, we are called to forgive one another. We are called to do what we've been talking about through this whole relational covenant thing, is to seek to honor and respect one another, to have gratitude, to have relationships that are God-honoring, to be gentle and loving and open communication. And now we get to consideration and respect, to respect one another that we all need to have the same grace given to us by Jesus. So if we always have to forgive people in the church, let me be clear about something, though. There's, well, one, as I mentioned this last week, and I'll mention it again in a moment, this is outside of is- issues of major, like, abuse, manipulation, safety. We're not talking about huge, huge, huge conflicts like that. God does not call us to be doormats. We're going to talk about that in a second. <laughs> but, but when we talk about normal conflict and normal disagreements, we're called to forgive one another. We just are. And that's just the way it is in the church. With brothers and sisters in Christ, we worship with, we live together, we are called to live at peace. Even if it's just bearing with one another, we are still called to go forward together. Um, And again, like I said, it's not going to be perfect. We're not going to get along with everyone. But that we're at least called to give that same grace and forgiveness we've received. Now, outside the church, I get a lot of questions about this. 
We have conflict outside the church with non-Christians. We think, what do we do about the heathen out there who has hurt me so bad? Do I have to forgive them too? Um, I think so. It's really hard because on the one hand, we say, okay, well, this is our church community. These are our brothers and sisters of Christ. Of course, we're going to try to do these things. But the outside world is still selfish. It's still trying to hurt me. It's still trying to take advantage of me. Do I really have to forgive them too? Uh, And the answer is yes, but I think there's a caveat. So outside the church, one of the things Christians sometimes think is we need to have a blanket rule to always forgive and forget no matter what. And then what happens is is people end up putting themselves in unsafe, even maybe inside the church too, let me be clear about that. But if it's a really unsafe, abusive manipulation situation that, that we shouldn't forgive and forget. Jesus, as I said, does not call us to be doormats. We can have boundaries. We can have safety. And we can do these things. But as Christians, again, in general conflict, not the big ones, but in general conflicts we run into, we are called to love and seek peace. And, and a lot of times those things need to be a case-by-case basis based on your relationship with the person and the situation around it. But we still have to have forgiveness. And it's for our own hearts that we have to have forgiveness, not necessarily for them. Let me explain what I mean. This is a simple one for me to share. Um, some of you may realize this, um, that, and I've shared this a little bit before, but I don't know my real dad. Last time I saw him, I was 11 years old. I don't know him. People ask me about my last name and my family history. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> it's this name, and that's pretty much it. Um, but what's funny about this is that for years, I was really, really angry about it. And I confess, it's still a process for me. It always is. But if he ever showed up, on my doorstep. If he showed up at my doorstep this afternoon, what is my role as a Christian? Is my role as a Christian to give him a big hug, tell him I love him, have a catch, invite him to my whole family and, make sure, and pretend everything's okay? No. <laughs> no, that makes no sense. <laughs> but I also should not slam the door in his face and use colorful language I wouldn't use in church. How do I balance this? See, I believe it's my duty to forgive him and let him know I forgive him if that opportunity ever came up. But it's also my duty to protect myself and my family and all of the things around it because he has acted in a way that has not been trustworthy, right? And so as people, we have, as Christians, we have to take the high road both in the church and outside the church. But to allow forgiveness to be the thing that motivates us. We can have boundaries, we can have safety, we can be honest about things, but we cannot allow anger to stay in our hearts, and we cannot allow anger to, and resentment and malice and all those things that are of the earth, or the, that are of you know, the human nature to rule our hearts, because we are called to forgive. And I don't know how this looks in all of your relationships and in all your situations, but we are called very, very clearly in Scripture over and over and over again to love and forgive everyone. And you've heard me say it before, and I truly believe it. As Christians, we don't have enemies. We just don't. Other people may consider you an enemy. You can't control others. We talked about that last week. But we are not called to have enemies. And so I don't know what the situation is outside the church, and we can't control that. But in most cases in life, we are called to forgive and make peace. And in most cases, we can be ambassadors for peace. In the church, we certainly can. Outside the church, as I said, case by case. But then we get into the how. (laughs) How is really hard, isn't it? How do we actually do this? And I want to wrap up with some thoughts on how we do it. It's not perfect. It's, it's, It's always a process. As I said, remember that these things, it's a process. It's happening. We're growing. We're trying every day. Here's an analogy I think of that I really, really like. Um, so when I was young growing up and still to this day, I'm a little more risk averse now in life. Um, but I used to love and still do cliff jumping, right? So you jump off a bridge into a lake, you, you go climbing up on rocks and jump into a river, you, you, you know, at the, at the ocean, you jump. I mean, basically, as a, as a teenager, if I was ever near an open body of water, I would look around and think, what can I jump off, right? If I was at a friend's backyard with a pool, oh, can I jump off that roof? Could I clear that? Yeah, I'm sure I could. So much fun. Now, <laughs> cliff jumping is great, but it's a lot better when you see someone do it first. 
You know what I mean? Like if you get to a spot and people are already jumping, you're like, oh, this is safe. I'll be fine. Let's go. If you're the only one there, you read about it or someone tells you about it, oh, yeah, hike over here and then just jump off this one rock. You'll be fine. And you go and stand up there and you look down at the dark water and you can't see anything underneath it and you think, will I be fine? And so you climb back down and you go swim around underwater and you make sure you're going to be okay. But even still, if you don't see someone do it first, it's a little nerve-wracking. This is sort of how I think about grace and forgiveness. If we've had examples of other people doing it, it makes it a little easier to forgive. If we've had examples in our home and in the church of people seeking forgiveness and seeking unity and seeking peace and being vulnerable, it's a little easier to do it. But if we've never seen it lived out, and if we've never seen people, parents, authority, church figures, whomever, model what this looks like, then when we're in a position to love and care for someone else, immediately we begin to doubt and think, will my apology open me up to an attack? Will they take advantage of me? Can I be vulnerable? Is this safe? And for some of you, you've tried and were so hurt because that other person did not act like Christ that you never want to do it again. So let me ask you a question. You don't have to answer. (laughs) Please don't. But not to be too personal, but what did you see growing up in your house? How, how was this idea of consideration and respect and grace and forgiveness modeled in your home growing up? Did you ever see your parents or other authority figures apologize or seek forgiveness? Many of us didn't. Many of us never saw this modeled. Many of us have never seen a parent, an authority figure, someone in, in, in a position of power and authority ask for forgiveness and say they're sorry. And that's really hard. It's really hard because if we don't see it modeled, then it's scary for us to do it. If we don't see someone jump off first and know it's safe, we stand up there and think, I'm not jumping. There's no way I'm doing that. Church is doubly bad. We don't do this at church. So if we don't model it at church, then we get in a position to to, to extend grace and forgiveness like Jesus did, and we say, well, I'm not doing it. Because every time I've been at church before, all other church people are rude and are mean and are not gracious and forgiving, and they're going to take advantage of me, and I'm going to get hurt. For way too long in our churches and our families and whatever, pride, power, and authority has been the driving force to keep us from consideration and respect. But what did Paul just tell the Colossian church? Put that crap away and put on the love and empathy and compassion of Jesus. We have all learned from our experiences, and many of us have had bad experiences, haven't we? We need to learn how to do this. And you know what? I got news for us. We have to be the first. If we haven't seen it, then it's on us to do it. Because we're losing trust. My wife has a coworker named Kurt. And Kurt always says, she shares this with me, that trust is a rapidly depleting resource in the world today. Isn't that good? Trust is a rapidly depleting resource. So think about that and then think about, are we fostering trust with how we treat one another in consideration and respect and giving grace and forgiveness? Are we choosing to show people grace and forgiveness, or are we living in anxiety and fear and wondering if we're going to be hurt? Because remember what, the, what John said in 1 John, that perfect love casts out fear, doesn't it? That the love of Jesus casts out fear, and that will bring trust back into the world. So we need to trust one another enough. This needs to be a place of trust so that when the world looks at us, when the world looks at church, when you deal with non-Christians outside, they see a trusting, loving, gracious, honoring community where it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to put yourself out there a little bit and say, hey, I'm really sorry, whatever needs to happen. Because if we do this, and we really believe, by the way, what Paul said to the Colossian church, there is none greater, there is none less, we are all on the same page. If we do this and we model it, then maybe maybe we will start having patterns where those who are looking to us will trust us enough to do it too. Because some of us have had those examples. Some of us had parents and authority figures who apologized to us, who were vulnerable with us, who were safe with us, and it allowed us to go and do that with others. And so we don't just do it inside the church, we also do it outside the church. 
And so we need to realize when we read scripture and we look at these things that we should be convicted. Friends, we are failing at this. (laughs) We should absolutely be convicted that we are not living like Jesus. However, we are not destroyed. We realize it is a process and that in church we will start by forgiving one another and then outside the church in our daily lives outside the church. Slightly different, case by case. I understand everything's different. But we also want to take what we cherish and value here and take it outside the church as well. Because grace and forgiveness shows people we have put on Jesus and put off that stuff that the world rejects. And so, brothers and sisters in Christ, my hope and prayer for all of us is that we would be a community like this, that we treat one another with consideration and respect. And when these things happen, that we do extend grace and forgiveness in our relationships. Would you pray with me?